The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I want to share a revelation <clears throat> that um, God gave me, and uh, I was looking at some old notes I had, and it said 1991. I thought it was 1989, 91. It doesn't make any difference. But this was one where I was sitting in a porch swing under a tree in a backyard. This is in Pennsylvania and got a download. You know, it's like when you have a download and you don't have paper to write, you don't have your Bible handy, you're just just sitting in a nice porch-type swing under a tree, enjoying myself, and all of a sudden I got this download. And, uh, but before I begin, can we show that, uh, that one slide? Uh, you see, the, when Jesus, that little figure down there, when Jesus had his earth walk, what did he tell Philip? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to declare the Father. But I believe that what the Lord was speaking to me in this message was showing me how the body of many sons coming to glory will express the Father. And what's difficult about this is when I started my first church, 40-some years ago, God said, here's what I want you to do. Because I told God, I don't know how to plant the church. And he says, this is what I want you to do. Four elements of an organic development, spiritual development, organically. Number one, you teach them who they are in Jesus. You teach them their identity, their individual identity, that it's a, a new creation. And the primary way that I taught this was like this. How many are familiar with Galatians 2.20? It is no longer I that live. Okay. I've, I've watched so much confusion in the church, even with leaders, on the word you. I ha you have to almost know what are they talking about when they say you. Right? Apart from him, you can do nothing. But then again, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The you is the new creation you, and that's the only way I think. When I say you, I'm talking about that new creation that never existed before. That they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. That's the real me that loves God and loves his word. And here's the verse that we use over and over again. Galatians 2.20. If it is no longer I who lives... This suggests it is no longer I who loves, nor I who forgives. And believe it or not, that one little application has literally revolutionized the church when we traveled. We saw people struggling with forgiving from the heart, although they knew you were supposed to. It is no longer I who lives. Well, then, who's walking around in this life that I'm living in the flesh? It's the new creation you, the new reality, where they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. That is the real you. And you need to think in the context that this is a new creation, something that never existed before. All right? If it is no longer I who lives, then it is no longer I who loves. What does that mean? You know, one of the most beautiful things that we have in the world is mother love. It's, it's beautiful to watch. An unsaved person can have mother, but that is still selfish compared to new creation love. It is no longer I who lives, then it's no longer I who's loved. Well, who's loving through me? We love because he first loved us. You can't give something you haven't received. And God doesn't want your flesh. What, you, what you've received of him, you give to him. As a matter of fact, in Leviticus, that would be your meal offering, wouldn't it? Whatever you've received experientially in Him, you offer. 
That's when you come to church, you don't come empty-handed. We're not talking tithes. I'm talking you don't come empty-handed. Is that without a transformation or a revelation of a change in your life, that is what you're offering Him thanks for. Otherwise, you're giving Him flesh. He doesn't want your flesh. He doesn't want sacrifice. I'm giving you a capacity to hear and obey. And where that takes place, where you hear and obey that reality, you express that reality, you thank Him for that, and you give that to Him. Now, if it's no longer I who lives, this suggests that it's no longer I who love, nor I who forgives. The most difficult thing when we traveled was we saw that people didn't understand who does the forgiving. Who does the forgiving? Only God can forgive. Remember, they, they got Jesus on that one, didn't they? How dare he? Only God can forgive sin. And he says, is it easier for your, me to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk, right? So is it true only God for, can forgive? Yes. But the, does he not say if you won't forgive, your heavenly Father won't forgive? Which you is that? It can't be your flesh. Only God can forgive sin. If you won't forgive, your heavenly Father won't forgive. Who's the you? It's that new creation you from the heart. Unless you forgive, your heavenly Father won't forgive. And we watch people sincerely with their head going, I tried to forgive for a year now, but I still want to kill that person. <laughs> All right, that's, that's flesh. True forgiveness that comes from the heart removes the toxic anger, hurt, whatever it was. Jesus is the only one that can take your pain and your sorrow. The best the world can do is medicate you, maybe. Or the best you could do is learn to suppress it, learn to exchange it, change subjects. Like Ronald Reagan, he dealt with his cigarette nicotine habit by going to Jelly Bellies. Well, it's more socially acceptable, might be a little less harmful, but he didn't deal with his addiction. He changed the subject. And churches, we were taught that. When I was a baby Christian, they say, Dennis, if you get a lustful thought, go to the Word. But that doesn't really work. That buys you a little bit of time. That's a, changing the subject is not the work of the cross. If I had a lustful thought, I need to take that lustful thought to Jesus and bring it through the work of the cross through forgiveness and repentance till it changes to peace. Peace means Jesus is ruling. Then I can take that thought and bring it captive. You cannot even take a thought captive to the obedience until there's peace, which means that he's ruling. Everything has to be the new creation you. But here's the thing that, that, that this diagram, and I'm going to show it because I feel like um, it must be time because God says you won't see this in your first pastorate except little glimpses of it. Teach them their individual identity. Teach them their individual gifting. And at that time, our church must have looked like a circus. It had four dance teams, flags, children's flags, children would stand on chairs and prophesy. And I took a hit for all of that stuff because in the early 80s, it was, prophecy was not popular, nor was all of this stuff dancing in church. Oh my goodness, that was heresy right there. And I took a hit for all of that stuff. But basically what I saw happen was I taught them their who they were in Jesus and learn how to deal from the heart, but also taught them the, their, their giftings. I really emphasize not so much the prophetic gifting, although we did, and the other giftings of 1 Corinthians 12, I emphasize the Roman gifting, that if you would start loving one another in the congregation, everybody's got the gifts of the Father. You know, mercy, serving, giving, all right? Start loving and I'll see what your gift is. Start moving because remember we used the illustration? If uh, I was up here and I knocked a glass of water over, uh, the giving person would say, I'm going to buy him a new set of pitcher and water. Uh, the, the servant would come up and not say a word with a dustpan, sweep it up. The mercy person would come up and go, oh, pastor, that must have felt so bad when you knocked that glass off. Okay. But the, people love differently, and we have to learn to love those differences, okay? So you got, you're with me so far? God says, I want you to plant a church, and I want you to do it in four organic levels. One, teach them who they are in reality, 
as new creation. Secondly, teach them their individual giftings. And he said, this third level you're not going to see until much, much later in your ministry. I, I think it's much, much later in my ministry now, so I want to see the third level. The third level is corporate identity. It's beautiful to be a new creation, but you know that in Ephesians is written to a mature church. There's two portions of Scripture in Ephesians that I want you to uh, open your heart to hear because this will take ears to hear. We are so individually oriented and we're so afraid of losing our individuality that corporateness sounds scary to some people. Like, I'm a potato and, and, and if I go corporate, I'll become mashed potatoes and I will lose my total identity and I will just be, I'll just be in this mass of nothingness. Okay, which is totally demonic. But anyway... <laughs> if this corporate identity says that the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you, that each part does, gives and receives, and does what it could, it works together, that Ephesians, the mature church, most of you even read this personally, you read Ephesians 1, uh, 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 apostolic prayer. What was uh, Ephesians 1, apostolic prayer? I bow my knee to the Father, that He would grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That's good. And that you would be strengthened by His Spirit in the inner man, that you might know the hope of His calling, His inheritance in the saints. Most people read that, it's all about me. No, his inheritance in the saints. Uh-oh, his inheritance in the saints. What's God's inheritance in the saints? When you think of inheritance, you think about what I'm going to get. No, no, what is God's inheritance in the saints? His ins he demonstrated on earth in that little figure, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's looking for people that can come together, be knit together by the Spirit as a body, and that ultimately He was the only begotten Son. Isn't that true? When Jesus came up on earth, He was the only begotten. But He wanted to be, He came to be the firstborn of many sons brought unto glory. The corporate identity is that, look what would happen if we demonstrated the Father corporately. Even in here, right. And by the way, I've got a theory. I think it matches, uh, I think I heard Rick Joyner say the same thing. I don't believe you're going to see massive numbers of people come together in unity. But I do believe you're going to see little Pentecost all over the place where two or three are gathered in my name. They're going to exemplify the Father. One can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. There is a multiplication factor in unity, all right? But his inheritance in the saints is that Jesus would get a body. Is Jesus the head of the body? What else would it be? There would be, let, let, show me that uh, second slide. He'd be the firstborn among many brethren. He would have a family. He'd be the head with a body and the chief cornerstone, is he not called the chief cornerstone, the one the builders rejected? He would have a temple. You, you, you primarily are aware that Scripture says you're a living stone, but did you ever think that maybe living stones ought to come together? <laughs> what a novel idea. God told me when I started my first church, no matter what you see, no matter how, how, how beautiful everything came together, it's only, it's only an image of what God wanted to do. He says, until the character and the nature of a corporate body expresses the Father. All right? And that's ultimately when we're going to see the glory. And I believe there's going to be little Pentecosts all over the world. They're going to, they're going to express the Father through a small group of people. I don't know. I, I think of Pentecost, uh, there was 120, but it started out with 500. What if Pentecost would have been 20 days instead of 10? wonder how many there have been in the upper room. If it started with 500 and ended with 120. But anyway, they needed to be 120 because... All right, let me start with the Revelation. All right, you can, you can keep that up there to refer to it. 
to get a concept of corporateness that the church usually doesn't have a concept of corporateness. All right. I'm sitting on a porch swing. And uh, I knew that uh, God had always spoken to me discipleship. That's our ministry. That's Jennifer's ministry. Uh, it's kind of like uh, you catch them, we'll clean them. Because discipleship for us means to bring them under full stature. The ministry's name is full stature. Full stature ministries. Kingdom life is the church uh, living that out. But in 19, I think my note said 91, I was sitting there and all of a sudden the presence of the Lord came down and, he, and the revelation was, and Dennis, the strategy in the end times is going to be you will strike the enemy as one man. Judges 6.16. And I had Judges 6.16 without knowing what Judges 6.16 was and was quoted by God to me. I like that part. Doesn't happen often. And I eventually sat there and I saw, and it went, Gideon's army. How many are familiar with that little story? They put torches in a pitcher and it was only 300 most of them were eliminated. It was a remnant. It was a small group that functioned together. Actually followed instructions. <laughs> Whatever Gideon said, do they did it. They actually did it. You know? Can you imagine how silly you'd feel with a torch and a pitcher and the enemies are all around you, and, but the boss says, just go, go stand there with a pitcher, and when I say <laughs> smash it, do it. Oh, dear Lord. I could see why the fearful were all eliminated. Right? They were tested at the water of the word. They were tested at the water. The fearful were eliminated. Ended up with 300. You know the part I like about that story, though? The 300 won a victory that every, the rest of Israel got to enjoy. The victory. I, I appreciated that. I saw that. But there were those that needed to be that design. So I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm going, you will strike the enemy as one man. I'm going, okay, what, what's that mean? And I knew it was corporate. And God took me then to Isaiah 9. It says, a people who sit in darkness shall see a great light. And the rod of the oppressor will be broken. And then it said, as in the day of Midian. That's who Gideon won. And Gideon, when he, when he met the Lord, which is interesting, he got a revelation of Jehovah Shalom. Isn't that interesting? He's going to make a mighty man of valor, but he's revealing himself as the God of peace. The God of peace that what? Crushes Satan beneath your feet, too. He revealed himself to Gideon. Gideon finally got his act together and believed God. Because <laughs> he started out with the excuses, like all Christians do, you know, all believers uh, my, my clan is the smallest. He goes, I am with you. He usually has to tell that to almost everybody. He needs to tell that to you, too. I am with you. If I am with you, you don't have any excuses. All right? So Gideon's there. He has a revelation of this God of peace and the strategy was to go into the enemy's camp, smash the pitchers, the light shines in the midst of darkness, and the enemy turns on each other. Now, before this happened, the enemy had a dream. And I love this part. He said, I had a dream that a loaf, a loaf of barley bread rolled into the camp, truly this is the sword of Gideon. They had a prophetic insight that God was going to use Gideon as one loaf, one man. You shall strike the enemy as one man. It's a corporate revelation. It's a strategy. It's a person. It's a place. It's a plan. And we're gonna, it's a purpose. And we're going to get into all of those things, maybe. Uh, but... The second scripture was Isaiah 9. Isn't that what Jesus did? Wasn't that a, a kind of a precursor to what Jesus did? 600 years before Jesus, Isaiah 9 basically says, a people who sit in darkness 
have seen a great light and the rod of the oppressor has been broken as in the day of Midian. So light shined in the darkness. Jesus is light, right? We're children of light. He's the father of lights. Light shined in the midst of darkness. It confuses the enemy, but it becomes the solution. Light has come into the world. People chose darkness because their deeds were evil. But those who come to the light become children of light. And God is the father of light. Now, the third thing was, after Isaiah 9, who came into the light, what happened, the next verse of Scripture that was quickened to me was Ephesians 2, where God made both Jew and Gentile remove the wall of hostility between the two and made one new man. One new man is that which never existed before. You with me so far? Now, I want to tell you the experience. This was in 1991. 1997, Jennifer and I get married and we're praying together and she's once discipled. She wants to document everything spiritual. And we're praying and we're in a room and we already knew that there was a special God calling on our life. Of course, everybody that's married should believe that, but ours was, even uh, Bishop Hammond said, ours was a prophetic marriage. It bypassed a, a lot of norms and said he'd seen in his 60 years of ministry five what he would call prophetic marriages, and ours was one of them. You can read our story in Deep Relief now. It's in, in the book, and I'm not going to get into that. But no matter where we went, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, we would run into total strangers in the mall, restaurants, and they say, you two fit. And if we heard that once, we heard it a thousand times. My landlord, who had given me, by inspiration from God, a free condo, fully furnished on the lake, that God told her. That's a story in the book. You read that one. And she says, look, when she met Jennifer, she says, God did not give her to you and you to her. God put you together for a kingdom purpose. All right? Now, we're sitting in this room praying. We're kind of newlyweds, maybe a year or two at that time. And neither one of us is talking, but we've always pray in the same room. And we're there, and all of a sudden, the presence of God came in in an extremely strong, unique way. Now, by sensitivity, by feeling, yeah, I use that word a lot, and, and I don't apologize for it, because there's spiritual feelings. There's carnal feelings, but there's spiritual feelings. The spiritual perception of the Spirit was so overwhelming, I blurted out a scripture and Jennifer blurted out a scripture. I said, this is two or more gathered. Jennifer said, this is one accord. Huh? It, it was an openness and a connection between the two of us. And we went to a church in Greer, South Carolina, and we started to minister to people. And God was supernaturally ministering to, they were all, uh, most of them were all pastors. Uh, they were all pastors. And they started, they started dropping like flies as we pointed to them. And they got up and they all testified the same thing, that they were, uh, they were pastors in training. A lot of them were in training. They said, when they got up, they said, God showed us that we were being knit together with our pastor, senior pastor, really. Then we went to New England, and now I got religious then. We went to New England to a church. That was in South Carolina. And I was going to, I said, I asked the pastor, can I meet with your leaders? Because I was going to point to them. They were going to fall to the ground, and they are all going to be knit to the pastor. Isn't that, it didn't happen that way. So anyway, that was Jill Mitchell at that time uh, said, you two have a oneness anointing. And I said, so she was confirming what we already knew experientially. So I had the leaders come together and nothing happened and it was really 
cold. And I went, okay, I missed that one. Then all of a sudden, married couples started walking up to us with tears pouring down their eyes. All married couples saying, pray for us because we've, we feel like God was telling you, telling us that you had something. We had that one. And we taught them basically how to open their spirit from down here to one another and melt into each other. <laughs> okay, now we're going to, don't try this at home without, without proper guidance from the Holy Spirit, okay? <laughs> this is not for single people. All right. All right. But that's what was happening in the upper room. They're being knit together. Because it was not, it was a corporate knitting. It was not just individual. We are so individual, it's unbelievable. God even told me, Dennis, you're going to teach these levels, but guess what? Don't expect to see the more mature level till later on. Well, this is later on, so I'm expecting to see something. You people start to love one another. Get knit. Connect, will you? So, anyway, uh, Ephesians 2 said, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, making peace. This was, and, and you know, how about in the Shema? Hear, O Israel, the Lord, God, the Lord our God is one God. The triune God fits in there, quite frankly, because one can be, Let's explain. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. There's a, there's a plurality. And here's what the Lord showed me, that in the latter days, Dennis, that, that what you saw in that oneness, you know, when a man leaves his mother and his father and the two become one, it's one, but you don't lose your individuality. Just like there's neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek. That doesn't mean you, you're no longer a male or a female. You're no longer a Jew or a Greek. It doesn't mean that. It means there is a new creation that's coming in. Something that never existed before. And here's what the Lord said, Dennis, in the days ahead, I want you, that's why the ministry is called full stature, is we don't do baby food here. If you want baby food, you probably should go somewhere else, really. Because... Uh, our whole goal is, is that third level of corporate identity of real quality relationships and interpersonal relationships where the rubber meets the road. And God says, here's what I did. And he used the example of a, uh, of, a, of a grape. And if you held a grape up to a projector, you would see a, a round silhouette. Now that grape could be Joe Heavy speaker. And that Joe Heavy speaker could be the most anointed person you've ever run into. That grape. But God is a God of design. And what he's looking for is an Ephesians 3.20 example. To the intent. If that grape was a cluster of grapes, and I held that up on a transparency, would not a cluster of grapes by design be far more recognizable than an individual grape? No matter how quality that grape is. God's looking for a corporate expression that has greater design, that by your love one toward another that the world might believe. They don't necessarily believe a bunch of grapes that are all greater or lesser knittings, and lesser knittings usually means, you know, lesser relationship. Lucy. And, and it's, I'm not talking project unity either. I've seen in the ministry over the years, I've seen project unity. That's where you're focusing in on a project. Everybody works together, but relationally, they might not even know who they are. But a cluster of grapes was a more clear design of what God had in mind for the church. Ephesians 3.20. Now remember, Ephesians 1 is that you would know the hope of his calling, the corporateness. That's his inheritance in you if you become part of his inheritance. It's not about individual. It's about participating in community, something bigger than you. It's like when you grow up. A child is dependent, becomes a, perhaps a teenager, becomes independent. I was. I was independent at nine. 
I didn't want my dad to go in the shoe store with me because I didn't want my friends to think that I was a sissy. I w of course, he gave me the money in the car, but then I would go in by myself at nine. But you know what? We have that in the church. That, that independence you think is maturity. That independence is immaturity. You haven't learned to be interdependent. You do not grow up until you become interdependent. Anybody can be independent. That's not a badge of accomplishment. I mean, compared to sickly dependent, it is. <laughs> but God basically was saying, the two have become one. The plurality of the Godhead functions in that oneness. And the oneness, whether it's man and God, one spirit, man and woman, one spirit, God is looking for a corporate expression to more completely depict. When we traveled, I found out, too, that we, we were not marketing people at all to this day. We're clueless. But we made our living traveling. That meant if you don't speak in a church and, and, and receive an honorarium, you don't get paid. You have no income. And we saw that we had to work seven days a week speaking. Nobody can live Sunday to Sunday. Hypothetically, even if you were booked every Sunday in somebody else's church, some of you people in ministry need to hear this because it doesn't work. If you got booked every single Sunday, and I don't know of any guest speakers that did, you could not make it one day a week. <laughs> you have expenses. You have travel. There's overhead. All right? So when we're traveling... God said, Jennifer and you do together, just like we do on Tuesday night. We'll both stand up here and preach at the same time. He says, you two do it together because the church needs to see it. Now, there were churches that wouldn't have us come because Jennifer was a woman. That's kind of sad. Uh, only men could preach, I guess. Um, and at times we said, and this is just being blunt here, but this is just like real life business end of it. We got the same honorarium if I went by myself or if Jennifer and I went together. You follow that? Yeah. So in your head, a little business mindedness, if Jennifer went there and I went there, it'd be a little more lucrative. We'd pay our bills a lot better. You don't get rich in ministry. Thank God I, I married a woman that had her own house. So, phew, that way I can, I can preach the gospel. I ain't afraid if anybody likes it or not. But it's true. And when we said maybe we should split up, the Lord said, don't you dare. You obey me and I'll take care of it. Because God wants that oneness anointing to go forward, and there's not enough of it. And when you think about it, there's not that many husband and wife teams, period. But it's to display more than a husband and a wife. It's to display an anointing of oneness. And we desperately need that. Two people living under the same roof is not oneness. That can be like a business merger. No. Single, we have a lot of single women in this church, but I'll tell you what, that puts a lot of pressure on the single man because um, you're going to have to be one that deals with your issues, <laughs> dies to your agendas, or they're not interested. They're not going to babysit you. They're going to expect you to be a man, stand on your own two feet, take care of the woman, hmm? protect, provide. Now, I saw this Ephesian scripture that God brought and broke down the dividing wall, made the two new, Jew and Gentile, one new creation. He also quickened another scripture to me in Genesis chapter 2, 5 that really got my interest. Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 says, this is creation. This is the beginning. It did not rain upon the earth, for there was not yet a man to till the soil. Oh, that's logical. It did not rain upon the earth because there was not man to till. 
It's not going to really rain until there's some kind of a representation of a man that's going to do something with what God pours out. I'm believing this rain's coming, but there's going to be little Pentecosts all around the world. And it might, and it might surprise you, and I'm in agreement with some of the prophetic boys, it's not going to be huge groups. It'll be a bunch of little groups that have just pursued God and are not afraid to be vulnerable and become part of something bigger than themselves. And it might be small. Solomon's temple, 120 priests, when they made the sound and were as one. The glory and the power of God. The day of Pentecost. All right. How many of you are note takers? You like taking notes, right? Raise your hand. Okay. For the note takers, I'm going to give this to you in a, in a sequential order. Okay. Are you ready for it? First of all, this one new man is a person. They're all P words, so that'll make it easy for you. First of all, there's a person. Who is this one? This one new man. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Is there perfect harmony in the Godhead? Yet we serve one God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know what the Didache says? The early Jewish apostles that were teaching Gentiles who were kind of clueless. They said, go ye. Actually, Jesus said it. Go ye and make disciples. Talmudim. Disciples immersing them in the reality of the Father, immersing them in the reality of the Son, immersing them in the reality of the Holy Spirit. That's a whole lot different than dipping somebody in baptismal water, saying in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Both are legitimate, but what they're talking about is a disciple that you don't just, that's a convert. A disciple is now mentor them into being what? immersed in the nature of the Father, in the nature of the Son, in the nature of the Holy Spirit. And to really do that, you have to be part of something bigger than yourself. Because he's got a body, he's got a temple, and he wants a family. God wants to equip an army, grow a family, right? And prepare a bride. And all those statements are corporate. Now, This is a person. He's the head. Jesus is the head. He's going from the only begotten to the firstborn among many brethren. That's his inheritance. His inheritance in us. Second of all, it's a place. It's a person. It's a place. What is the place? The place is unity. But it's a unity by the Spirit, not man-made and not project unity. It is spirit connection, unity, where two or more are gathered in my midst. Hmm? This is one accord, what burst forth in Jennifer and I. This is one accord. We were sitting silently, and Jennifer said, this is one accord. I said, this is two or more gathered in the midst. And we were describing scripturally the nuance of the spirit that had ushered into the room while we were sitting silently and praying. And Jennifer says, this is what, I have peanut gallery up here telling me what else to say in the front row. She says, this is what was happening in the upper room. And just think the ones that left before the 10 days were up. I, I know how that happens. Excuses. Either business, relationship, or possessions. But there was a reason. Those things is what keeps people from coming. It'll either be business, possessions, or relationships. I've just married a wife. I gotta go. Uh, I've got I've got some oxen. I've got to test out, and you know that excuses never change. All right. So this place, Solomon's temple, the day of Pentecost, this third P. It's a person, it's a place, <clears throat> but it's a plan. And this is what the Lord hit me with sitting under that tree in that swing when he says in the end times this will be a strategy. This is the plan. You will strike the enemy as one corporate man. 
you will strike the enemy. If one can chase a thousand to ten thousand, that's not a platitude. That there's got to be a biblical pattern and principle. God has to be decreeing and declaring that that has always been His way, is for interdependence. And here's the, here's the part that really gets me. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, To the intent, that means purpose, to the intent that the manifold, multicolored, multifaceted wisdom of God would be displayed to principalities and powers. Kind of shake your fist at the demonic principalities and powers. To the intent that principalities and powers, that the wisdom, the many, <laughs> multifaceted, manifest presence of God would be made known to principalities through the church. That's corporate. That corporate man is going to be the stronger man. How do we spoil the goods when a stronger man comes in, right? That's going to be the stronger man. The corporate man is going to be stronger than the individual believer. Now, the purpose, if that's the plan or the strategy, to strike the enemy as one man, that's where the victory is going to be, then the purpose is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things that are in Messiah, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. That's the purpose, the intent, to gather together. Jennifer teaches on the wise virgin, uh, virgins. They basically have their lamps filled. They're part of something bigger than themselves. They're not just merely saved. They've got the oil. They're filled with all the fullness of God. Now, here's what I did when I got back in the house and I started looking up some scriptures. I just looked up, where, where is that expression, one man? Where else is it in the Bible? And I got five examples of where the concept is. Note takers, write these down. Worship, word, warfare, witness, and work. I'll do it slower. I realize some of you are not typing. <coughs> Worship, word, warfare, witness, and work. All right. Second Chronicles, worship. Second Chronicles 5. Indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one and making one sound. 120 priests, interesting. Isn't that the same amount that was in the upper room? In Solomon's temple, 120 trumpeters and singers were as one making one one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, that the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud, that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled, it, filled the house of God. We had that happen in the Berkshires, in the Great Barrington, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, right? <laughs> the Berkshires, yeah. Great Barrington, Massachusetts. We were in there, and the weight came down to where there were some unruly kids running around, they stopped dead in their tracks. That's God. That's not something orchestrated by a leader. Unruly kids, stop. The worship team were playing music. They put their instruments down and they quit because of the weight of God. God is basically, but you know what they were known for? They would always have Jennifer and I come to speak because they said that their church wanted oneness more than anything else. They wanted real oneness, not, not crowd. Amen. You can have, get a crowd. There's all ways to get a crowd. To get oneness requires a work of the Spirit. <laughs> when musicians put their instruments down, 
for no one wanted to do anything or say anything. And they just welcomed the weight of God's presence to transformation. We've only seen that a couple of times, but that one was significant. In the Word. By the way, in worship, this is something we want to do in this church. In worship, Hebrews 10, 12 says, I will declare your name to, uh, to the brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. We've always said, when you come to worship service, it doesn't matter whether you like the songs, you don't like the songs, whatever, is why not open up horizontally to one another and let Jesus express himself through us corporately? Most of you think this way, me and Jesus. Well, you can do that at home. You can't have a corporate anointing at home by yourself. <laughs> Unless you have multiple personalities, then you will get you delivered. You cannot have a corporate anointing by yourself. All right? So when you come into a corporate setting, whether it's two or three, open up to one another and say, we, our Father, not my Father, our Father. You start getting a concept that, that's bigger than me. But there is an expression going forth into the heavenly realm that's a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. And it's coming from us, we, in the midst of the brethren. Okay? That's worship. They come together as one. Now we come together, an example in Scripture, where they came together to hear the word. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded. Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was making up of men and women. All who were able to understand, all of the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra opened the book, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen and Amen. And they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. There was a convergence here where they came together as one. They, hear the, uh, they had not heard the law. It had been kept from them, or they had walked away from it. And now it was being represented to them. And with humble hearts, they trembled at the hearing of the word as one man. Those are times of great transformation. That's times of convergence when things come together and start moving forward. This is when you begin to tremble at God's word. All right, the third one, warfare. Now, we've already talked about that one. Gideon said, Dennis, in the end times, you're going to see that you're going to strike the enemy as one man. Corporateness is going to be a tool in the hands of God through his body. And in warfare, it's basically, surely I will be with you and you will defeat the Midianites as one man. And those who turn the world upside down in Acts 17, those are the ones that turned the world upside down. Those that were there on the day of Pentecost, they began as one man on one accord. And I always thought it was so interesting that God appeared to him as Jehovah Shalom the God of peace, who then will crush the enemy beneath your feet. Wow. Mm. Peace in here, experientially, is what we've taught the body of Christ for years. Is that you can say all the right scriptural answers, you can be a real Bible student, but unless it's coming from the place of peace, Jesus isn't ruling. And God doesn't really care about your flesh or your ability to recite. Quote, so much... Believe it or not, if you went by discernment, so much decreeing and declaring has no anointing on it. They're just saying the right answer. And thank God, they're, they, thank God they know the right answer. That's a good start, but that's not where it ends. It needs to be a transformed life. It needs to be the word written on the tablet of the heart. It needs to come from the place of peace. Peace means who's ruling. You know, even your toxic emotions could be your friends if properly applied. If you're walking around and you're angry... That could be a signal going, Jesus isn't ruling right now, Dennis. You feel that anger? Yeah, Jesus isn't ruling. Because it's the power behind the thoughts. It's the power behind the words. It's not the right words and the right answers. It's the source, the source, the source. That's warfare. How about witness? 
John 17, 21, I pray that they would all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe. I believe the world's going to believe much more the gospel when they see a cluster of grapes as opposed to Joe Heavy speaker grape. Hmm? Jesus already did the example of, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now the world needs to see the Father. He needs a corporate expression. How good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil that flows down Aaron's beard. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It's attractive to the world. It reveals the majesty of God. And the prayer of Jesus that they might be one as you are, that they also may be one in us so that the world might believe. That's the fourth element, the witness. An adequate witness has to be the love of God. The two things in the church we call great need work done. The great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbors yourself. And that includes your enemies. And go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, what we call the great commission. Not converts, disciples. What I loved about the Didache is they would train a Gentile who had no, no background in the Ten Commandments, no morality, and they taught them. Now watch this. I want to see you do this. They taught them to not just bless them that curse you. We know the scripture, right? Bless them that curse you. Pray for them. This way. They said, fast for your enemies. Huh. Fast for your enemy. You know, with fasting, it's not that your prayers are no good, but when you fast, there's actually a sacrifice involved in it, isn't there? Because I can give the right words real easy. Uh, all right, that, that boss at work, he hates me. Uh, bless him, Lord. Or fast for him. You know what happens when you fast? There's a, there's a more diligent approach to the mission. And in that diligence, what happens is, you are forgiving from the heart, that enemy. Your heart changes. And they are the victim. Spirit of revelation will show you they're the victim. And you don't have an enemy. Would that be valuable? Because most of the people I know in the church, poor me, they picking on me. Oh, they don't, oh, oh. I'm wounded, I'm rejected. I go church to church because I was hurt in church. Sheep have teeth. <laughs> Shepherds have sticks. <laughs> yeah. Right? That whiners, Joe and Helen Weiner. Joe, what hell? I don't like that message. <laughs> They're everywhere. But they, they just, they don't change. God's looking for people that are going to release forgiveness. Can you imagine taking a Gentile who knew nothing and telling them, you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, the God that made you, yeah. And you're going to um, fast and pray for your enemies because it'll change your heart. Hmm. I even wonder how many Christians will bless them that curse you and pray for them that despitefully use you. This is before they had the scriptures. This is the teachings of the apostles to the Gentiles who were clueless. Just like our culture right now. If we got a lot of people saved right now, it would be the same identical. They have no value system except that which the world has taught them and brainwashed quite effectively. Even media. How many of you are astute enough, in, in all honesty, to watch any television program and see what they're doing? Yes. Can you see they're shaping the way you think? Huh? Situations, I don't care if it's law and order or what it is, those programs are shaping the way you think. Well, you know, they had to tell these Gentiles, don't leave your babies out in the cold just because it's a girl. You don't abort. You don't take drugs to kill the babies. They're going, really? 
Everybody else does. Right? That'd be a culture shock for them, wouldn't it? And basically saying, they'd have to be shown scripture. Old Testament scripture says, children are the inheritance. They belong to God. That's God's inheritance. So no, ladies, that is not your body. That is not your child. That is God's child. And there's plenty of scripture to validate that. Your thinking has been distorted by culture. Not the word of God. The Didache somehow took these Gentiles who had ten gods, no morality, and got them focused. And that is discipleship. And that's really where the church is right now. The church needs discipleship. It's the least taught subject. Oh, we have teachers. I'm not talking about teachers. I'm talking about equippers. I'm talking about trainers. Actually, the Didache means Training, not teaching, although it goes back and forth. They'll call the Didache teaching, but it's training. There's a big difference between teaching and training. When Jennifer got her doctorate, she was reading a book that was theologically sound, but she really questioned whether the guy was even saved. You know, you can be a scholar, you can be orthodox, and you can be dead spiritually. <laughs> So God's basically saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, He is one God. And I believe that I'm going to see in my lifetime the beauty of corporateness and what it'll do. We have nine pastors here that we meet every Sunday. We have that. Most of them came from different, even parts of like Cliff and Steen and all, Molly and all them. They came from Massachusetts, wherever we were traveling during that time. And they are parts of That kind of knitting doesn't happen automatically. That happens by reason of use. But we're also going to have the Jews and Gentiles joined like the first yeah. church. And like the first church, Jennifer says, when this is what's in the book, they're going to have Jew and Gentile joined like that into something that never existed before that's supernatural. You can know it and know that Jesus himself broke down the wall of hostility between the two, but you need to understand it's a new creation. It's something that never existed before. And we need to be open to that. How many husbands and wives would like to have prayer right now? Amen. Stand up. And if you're watching by YouTube or Ustream, husbands and wives need to stand together. God's basically saying... <clears throat> There needs to be a fresh new openness toward one another. And we're not talking about open-mindedness. We're talking about open-hearted. Oh, yikes. I can feel tension. This is not comfortable. That's your flesh. All right? I want you to receive forgiveness from the forgiver that lives in you, down your heart, I receive forgiveness for not being open or putting up walls to my husband. Husband, I receive forgiveness for knowingly or unknowingly putting up walls to my wife. Well, there's got to be a good percentage of you doing it because the atmosphere is getting better. Now, melt into each other right now, spirit to spirit. I bet you never saw this done in church before. They that are joined together are one. There's a oneness that's spiritual. There's a oneness on paper. But the oneness that's spiritual is what we're after right now. What you've joined together, God, seal this beautiful work by the power of the Holy Spirit. And don't let anything come between what you and I have together. And don't let anything come between what we have together. We, our Father, Jesus. Boy, Terry's obedient. He's doing it with his wife right now, and she's not here. She's watching. Right? She's watching. Terry, Christy, Terry's doing a good job right now. He's opening up to you right now. 
Right. There's no distance in the spirit. We taught this to pastors in, Mass in uh, Connecticut, and her husband was on the mission field in Africa, and she opened up and she could feel the knitting of intercession from him. And he called right at that time and said, I could feel you, you're praying for me right now, aren't you? That's the kind of relationship you're supposed to have. That's the reality. So, Father, right now, we thank you. There's an increase of anointing right now. There's a one-man anointing right now coming in here. In the name of the Lord, a little Pentecost. Let's have a little personal Pentecost in your house where two or more are gathered in, in the midst. There am I, says the Lord. There it is right there. There it is. It's, it's increasing here. It's increasing. Welcome it. Yeah, individuals, you are not neglected. If you're single, you're not neglected. He places the solitary in families. Open up to the church family. Open up to one another right now in the name of Jesus and participate in it as one corporate man. Yield, I yield, and I make connection spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath with the wonderful body of Jesus. His beautiful body, his bride, his family, his temple. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh, you want to take that home. Some of you ought to go on, some of you married couples ought to go on date night this afternoon. Don't wait till tonight. Date afternoon. I had an amazing revelation when Dennis gave this message. And do you remember when uh, Gideon and his army fought the Midianites, God identified himself as shalom. The Hebrew word for shalom, one of the definitions is completeness. If you use unity in warfare, your warfare is not complete without the body. Very good. Very good. Very good. That's a good word. As a matter of fact, we've been saying that, we've been saying that recently a lot, is that you need to win the warfare within to make your warfare without more effective. Because there's a lot of people think they're in warfare, but it's the, their own flesh is beating them up. Your unresolved issues, unnecessary trials and tribulations. To be effective in spiritual warfare, come together. There's actually a protection in it. There's a safety in it. It becomes like a city of refuge. There's a canopy of love, acceptance, and forgiveness that creates an atmosphere that actually keeps the enemy out in a large degree. But you still have to deal with the enemy within. Deal with your own issues, otherwise you're living with, un say that word with me, unnecessary trials and tribulations and calling it warfare. No. There's enough warfare. We can eliminate the unnecessary stuff, right? Okay. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.